Okay, so today's topic is very exciting. Uh, personally for me, uh, we will be talking about applying artificial intelligence to test automation. And um, I'll consider that on two specific technologies, on uh, static test analysis and on unit testing, though, of course, there's many other ways how we can and should test our products. If I have time, I will touch on those at the very end, but we'll see how it goes. Um, several words about Appearsoft. We are in business of helping our customers, uh, software development organizations, to improve the quality of their um, software de delivery, their tools, increase the confidence, and basically accelerate their delivery of reliable, more secure, and uh, compliant, compliant software. We are um, located near LA uh, in the United States. And we've been in business for over 30 years. Um, we actually provide complete set of uh, quality tools, uh, starting with static code analysis, unit testing. We provide technology to drive Selenium web UI test executions, automate API testing, and we have uh, service virtualization technology as well. Um, we built all this technology over the years. Um, we're using our internal teams, um, so we have a very strong, good expert in those technologies um, and knowledge been accumulated over the time. So it was recognized by multiple patents, which we registered. And on the bottom, you just see several recognitions from different entities um, of our achievements over just the last several years. So before I will talk about how we actually apply artificial intelligence and machine learning, to software quality, I want to talk a little bit about definitions of those terms because they've been used recently a lot. And um, I want to be a little bit clear about what we mean when we talk about, for example, artificial intelligence, which is a very wide range of um, different behavioral models of computer software, which it kind of exhibits that human behavior intelligence through ability to reason and through ability to learn. If you talk about machine learning, it's more specific kind of subsystem of artificial intelligence, which specifically specialized on learning from observations of their data and change its own behavior based on those observations and learning without human interaction. So the idea here that software will become smarter and will basically change their behavior uh, based on what it observes. Deep learning is a subset of machine learning where we basically software learns on huge amount of data. We're talking about hundreds of terabytes. And neural network is just way how that huge amount of data can be represented um, through simulation of like human neural networks. And that allows that software to reason in very highly intelligent way. Um, so it's just one of those very advanced models. Of course, when we talk about artificial intelligence, we mostly um, talk about machine learning because that's where the smartness in behavior happens and that's the most interesting cases, but we are working with neural networks as well. So when we talk about the testing, probably the best way to represent different hierarchy of uh, testing practices would be testing pyramid. Um, which uh, was introduced um, by Martin Fowler uh, to actually show uh, what emphasis should be on, on the test. Uh, it's from bottom up, where on the bottom it should be the most um, focused for, from the test perspective. It's uh, the best way to actually eliminate the problems in the cheapest way. And as you go up to the pyramid, you want to reduce the emphasis of your testing because those methods becomes more and more expensive. And on the very top, you have manual tests which we know is the most expensive way to test software, but it's still necessary. We added on the very bottom uh, static analysis. I, I believe the original pyramid was kind of having unit tests at the bottom. Static analysis is something that we believe the developers should do even before they start compiling the code. So all, a lot of potential problems can be detected in that area before program even executed. Uh, but each of these layers has their own challenges. Unit tests, we know that it's usually unstable because of brittle UI, because developers change it very often. And sometimes um, it's randomly because maybe 
server which runs all the tests becomes uh, performance dependable. And this is like, because of different time conditions, the, the test might start failing. And it works on my system, it works on developer systems, but it will be failing randomly on continuous integration pipeline. API test, it's a great way to actually execute your functional test uh, even before you start doing UI testing. But it comes with the lack of, very often lack of knowledge how those APIs can be used. Um, in some cases they are not documented or even if individual API is documented really well, how you will combine them together and build the business logic to replicate all different possibilities of usage which client will use over time. Um, QA people um, might struggle, or even some developers might struggle, who didn't implement those APIs on their own. And there could be like hundreds of thousands of APIs. So it's very challenging. Unit test, we all know that's something that developers have to use on a daily basis, but being under pressure of deliverables, uh, milestones, and so on, sometimes they just will claim that they don't have time to write those unit tests and trying to achieve the high code coverage metrics, it's not achievable for them because they just would say, hey, we need to hire um, more developers for that. And static code analysis, which we already talked about, even if the, the basis for us to actually where we want to start testing, it has its own challenges in, in the way that when it's applied and the rules turn on on the code base, sometimes then hundreds, thousands of those violations might pop up and developers will be discouraged to working with them because now they will like, where do we start? We have thousands of those violations, how we can start fixing them. So we have technology for each of those layers, um, which actually um, we have tools and we apply AI on each of them. I will start with static analysis and our solutions is basically, it's applying machine learning clustering technique to help the developers to Pre, uh, create the priorities of the violations which you need to fix. But the, the questions at the beginning, I mean, why we even bother to use static analysis and why it's so difficult and expensive? Well, we know that for safety critical industries, you don't have a choice basically. Your software has to be in compliance with specific standards like AutoZar, MISRA, but even for other industries, applying standards such as uh, CWE, WASP top 10, CERT, it's very beneficial because it will guarantee that you will reduce the potential of security risk through this methodology. But if development teams start using that static analysis from the very beginning when they just start writing the code, it's natural for them. Every time they will compile the code, they will detect new problems for static analysis, they will fix it away. But very often they apply those static analysis and turn on those rules way after they already start development. They may be dealing with even legacy project with like, which contains hundreds, thousand, millions lines of code. And when they turn them on, they will be overwhelmed with so many violations, could be 50,000 of them coming. And what makes it worse, that many of those violations may be perceived as false positives. So we kind of split in, in group of, we're talking about real uh, false positive violations where tools might not be 100% accurate, we know that it's reality of the light, but in most cases, those violations will be what we call emotional false positive. It's just because the customer doesn't care about them. He not completely turn off the rule because in some cases they will, the rule will find something positive, something that he need to fix. But in most cases, probably they will consider it to be a noise. So, and some checkers kind of split half half. So our challenge was that with the way how we challenge ourselves saying like, hey, how we can looking on historical data, looking at the new violations which comes to, to the systems and discovered on the new code modifications, observing the user behavior, how he fixed the violations, can we build some model which will actually help the user to filter out that noise and focus on those violations which are real true issues which need to be fixed. And we started with hypothesis. So I'll drive you through several slides which kind of explain how we were our journey through this discovery process, it's I hope you appreciate it because it's interesting. We start from hypothesis that all those violations comes kind of in groups. If one of the violations from that group, for example, is suppressed, that there's a chance that others from the same group will be suppressed as well. And if one of them need to be fixed, uh, probability that others need to be fixed in the same cluster will be very high. 
we come to this um, assumption based on the fact that when we look at their metadata, we associated with every violation, such as which, which rule ID was used to detect the violations, what the severity, in which code base it was discovered, who was the developer's name. We look at the, those properties, and there's about 20 plus of those. They highly correlate with each other, meaning if one of them change, the, the, the others will be changed as well. So they kind of tied to each other, which indication that in this multi-dimensional space, there would be clusters which will be formed by those violations. And indeed, when we look at our own projects and we projected them onto dimensional space, we discovered those groups of violations which next to each other and whether they all need to be fixed or they all can be suppressed. So our next challenge was, okay, so we can build a model to represent this multidimensional space and discover those clusters. But how many violations we need to first analyze to be sure that we can train the model and make it 95% accurate, like highly accurate model to predict. We did some experimentations and I was surprised that we've discovered that about 20 violations should be enough to build pretty accurate model. Of course, when I challenged my team and we start talking about that, the assumption that those 20 violations comes from different places around all this entire space of violations, because obviously if they come from one group, from one cluster, they are not representative. So they will, the model will not be able to do anything but just detect that cluster. So it has to be kind of picked up through entire space and we figured out that if you'll just do random selections, that works pretty well. So random um, identification of those 20 violations and training them should be enough to make our model pretty good. Then we look at the different classification techniques and we apply multiple of them on the left side. Some of them performed really well. Some of them were like, eh, not much. So we choose four of those classification techniques and we run them all at the same time. And depending on different project, it's unpredictable. Which sources people using, how they do introduce those violations, how they fix them. In some cases, one of their classification methods could be better than another one. So we, at the end, we run all of them and then we compare and pick up the one which actually behaves the best. And here where I challenge the team because I was surprised. Like you probably, if you, if, you, if you noticed, I'm talking about the violations. I didn't mention anything about the source code. So we didn't even discuss about in which sources those violations happening, what the source is trying to do. We didn't even look at the sources at this point and nevertheless, the model works. And after thinking about it, like how that's even possible, it's, it definitely even looks like human behavior. Uh, I was actually explaining, and it sounds logical to me. Think about if you're dealing with a developer who actually not a good developer, who doesn't follow good practices and introduce a lot of code, a lot of errors inside the code, then the model will learn eventually that if violation comes with the name of the developer, that most probably it's severe, it has to be fixed. And, or if you, working on the model, which is very overcomplicated, and it consists of tons of different problems which has to be solved in the past, then again, the model will learn that if violation comes from that model, then even without knowing what actually happens inside, it can predict with high probability that it's probably a real violation which needs to be fixed. So it's okay, I was convinced that's good, but then, what if you'll add some information about the code itself on top of this model? Will it improve or not? My assumption was, yeah, it should improve. So we find techniques where we kind of pick up the sources around the violations um, and we can create a digital vector, kind of virtual, uh, vectorize that sources. And when we combine them with metadata vectorizations, which we already kind of build a prototype on top of that. My assumption was that now if you run our classification technique, it should give much better results. Well, the moment of truth, and you'll see on the left side, the only metadata, which kind of represent the curve and the, the, the higher the curve, the better the model is. And you'll see on the right side, it's combination of metadata with the source code information. And I was surprised that there's no, almost no differences. So there's no improvements. How that possible? And again, when we started thinking deeper about that, we came to a conclusion that our mistake is that we are 
looking at the metadata of the project, which actually coming from our own development teams, it's well structured, which kind of established over a long period of time. We don't have any developers moving around. They all follow good practices. So the metadata itself, it's very good already representation of the knowledge to make prediction. But what happens if we're dealing with some development teams who is kind of rotate the people all the time, maybe hiring a lot of students who doesn't follow good practices. So what if we'll start introducing the noise in the model? What would be the difference? And indeed, when we start adding the noise to the metadata, we see that quality of the model goes down. On the right side though, you see that curve still stays. It's more, more sustainable model. And when we introduce a lot of noise, the metadata itself becomes almost like random. You can uh, throw the coin and, and predict 50-50 chance that your discovery will be false positive or real, um, where that using the same noisy metadata model on top of the source information which we inject, we actually achieve pretty reliable, stable um, system, which still can perform pretty well. So our conclusion was, we first built this prototype with just metadata based um, model, then we added the source information and we achieved pretty good result. Uh, we've been recognized, um, we presented this technology last year on Embedded World and we were like recognized by Embedded Award. So it was one of the best in this area. Um, the way how it works, if you put all things together, is basically developers send the code build them overnight using one like CI pipeline, for example, Jenkins, that the same pipeline will run static analysis as part of build executions. And they will send the data to centralized repository, what we call like um, analytical engines and the system which actually can represent all the data. We have the system we call DTP, which has wonderful dashboard, uh, which can show you what's happening. And that system, we'll have the, what we call brain. We will have this analytical engine, which actually be able to learn. It can be trained and learn uh, based on observation of those violations and predict which of them has the highest probability to, to be real problems. And then developer can download those highly, highly predictable problems on their own IDE environments and work on them, fixing them with the highest priority. When I talk about the the brain itself, obviously there's two ways how to work with that. It can be manually trained and it has to be manually trained when you don't have any data yet. So as you only just start working on the static analysis, uh, then you have to go through manual process. If you already have a lot of data in your system over time, then it can basically train based on observations at how those violations were fixed in the past. So you don't need to do manual procedures. I'll show you both ways how we do that. So for the manual things, it will pick up those 20 random violations. You will basically classify them. You create a model and you make predictions for the rest of the violations. If you follow this um, classified based on historical data, the process is the same, the only di different part that you don't need to actually spend your time on manual training. So let me show how it works. I have this DTP system, which actually, um, our reporting engine. It has a lot of information about different um, tip, uh, different knowledge about the projects. And one of them is number of violations which exist in the system today. So if I click on this widget, I will uh, go into Violation Explorer, which actually shows me all the violations which were detected. Uh, when I click on each of them, it shows me a uh, line of the code sources where the problem was detected. And it gives me some description of what the problem is. I can read the documentation that described me what, the, what this, the issue was. It gives me some example of those particular problems and how it can be fixed. I can look at their history of that violations when it was introduced and so on. And there's the very first step gives me ability to create Jira tickets for this violation to be fixed, assign them to a particular developer and uh, change the priorities and so on. So, but before I'll start working on them because there's 170 of them, I, I want to figure out which of them I need to fix first probably. So here's a brain icon. I go here and model doesn't exist yet because we just started from zero. So I'll have to go through this classification process which will tell me, hey, um, let's do it manually first. 
And indeed, when I click, it will show me 20 different violations, which basically tells me, hey, please classify them. What I'll do something right now, which I will never suggest to you to do in real life. Actually, I have to go through each of them in, in very detailed, look at each of them and say, well, is it real violations or not? Because that's the knowledge which I will basically give to the system. But instead of doing that, we don't have time. I'll just go through all the violations which has lower severity, for example, three, four, five, not two, two is a good one. And um, I will mark them as, let's assume that they all need to be suppressed because maybe they are those which I called emotional um, violation, right? So let's say suppress. Okay, good. Now the rest of the violations will be higher priority. They all severity one or two, and I'll make the, say, hey, let's fix. So now when I apply and go back to my model, it basically say, okay, you finish a classification, let's train the model. And I will say confirm. It spent some time a little bit and it shows me, well, look, I have excellent model right now. And by the way, it gives me a view on how many different classifications algorithm was used and which one was selected. It's suspiciously good, but well, let's do prediction now. So we build the model, it shows the model quality of the model is good. And it's predicted out of their 145 violations, it tells me that 56 of this, those need to be fixed. Okay, good. So if I go back to, there's actually a column, you can see that predictions and it shows me that, well, they're all 100%, the system 100% confident that their violation need to be fixed. And now I look at the severity, they all one or two. So what happens here, is because I didn't do a good job on training, the system learned from like, if it means the violations severity one or two, that it's highly confident that, that the real violation is to be fixed, which really what I told the system to do, I teach it that way. So it's learned from me. Good, I go back to dashboard, I refresh my, my widgets and it does show here the distribution that tells me, hey, here are the violations, 100% confident that need to be resolved. The rest were like, well, low priority. Let's look at the different things because this project, the way how I train it is not interesting. Let's look at the project which has much more violation and it has historical data. So now instead of doing this manually, I can just like 5,000 violations, I can go inside the explore, pick up this model. And again, it's empty yet. So let's train it. But this time, instead of doing manually, we'll just use historical data and confirm. So it will go through all the past history of the build. It will extract all the violations from there and learn from them which of those violations were fixed, which not, and use them as a training set. And it did, indeed identified 723 violations, which it learned from. So now it's ready to be trained. So let's execute training and we'll see whether the quality of the model will be the same or different. Well, it's still excellent, but you'll see that results are a little bit different. Now we don't have 100%, it's kind of a little bit all over the places. Um, and if we'll do predictions, we had originally 5,000 violations. Let's see how many of them it will be able to automatically identify whether they need to be fixed or not. Wow, over like 4,300 are detected to be fixed out of 5,000, perfect. If I look right now, you see that prediction percentage, it's not, the confidence is not 100% anymore. So it, it tells me that this model is better because obviously this historical data is kind of more distributed. So it shows me more interesting information. So let's refresh and see this distribution chart. Mm, okay, interesting. So it did define this, oh, about 300 violations which has high confidence that they real problems. There's like about almost 4,000 Still 60%, about 50% confident is good. Cool, so that, that's kind of the, the way how it can help the developers to define the priorities. Let's go back to my presentations. Um, so we didn't stop on that one. We actually introduced three more uh, technology which helps to work with violations. One of them, a uh, hotspot detection. It's basically coming from the area that there could be multiple violations which has one core reason of them, but they can be appearing all over the places. For example, 
let's say that some class uh, utility method initializes the internal variables with new, right? Um, so instead of assigning real object, the object will be new. And then all over the, your code base, you use this utility method and you'll try to reference that object, which apparently doesn't exist. So the static analysis will detect that you have like hundreds of no reference exceptions, which basically the reason for them is only one single place of the code. So hotspot detection, it helps you to identify those areas inside your code, which you fix in one place. Here, for example, example, you have 345 hotspots detected and one of them has 54 violations. So the system tells us if you go and fix this one area of the code, one problem, you'll automatically address all 54 of those violations. There's extreme example on the right side where you have one hotspot which associated with almost 160 violations. Again, it tells me, hey, start with this one problem, you fix it, and with the smallest return of your, uh, your spending of your time, you'll get the best return on your investment. So hotspot is one technology. Another interesting technology, which comes from way of thinking of, of our own developers. Hey, if I fix this violation right now, and I'm working with this area of the code, what if system will find all similar, synthetically similar pieces of the code around the, my entire project, which might have similar problems, which actually will have the violation as well. So system might suggest me to fix violations which still exist in the source code, which comes from the same area, which probably I'm expert at because I'm just was fixing this one. So that can actually increase my productivity because instead of jumping between different, totally different violations unrelated to each other, the system can help me to figure, find those which kind of correlates with each, uh, with each other. And another technique is very interesting called matrix factorization, which kind of similar to what you would do on Netflix. So on Netflix, when you watch a movie, you mark it, you like it or you don't like. And we'll say, well, when developers fix the violations, let's use interpretation, they like it. When they have to suppress, let's say they don't like it. So we use the same similar approach. We basically can look at what developers working on and predict which violations based on what, which one he fixed. So this matrix factorizations, when new violations come to the system, we can predict which violations most probably will be, need to be addressed by developer A, which of them need to be addressed by developer B, just based on their experience, what they work in the past. So if I put all these different technologies working together for static analysis, let's assume we have this initial 5,000 violations coming into the system. I will apply this um, clustering technique first, which will filter out false positives. And then on top of that, I will do factor um, matrix factorizations to distribute automatically, tell me which of those most probably need to be addressed to different developers, so distribution across my development teams and run hotspot on top of that. So then developers can start fixing with the, fixing those violations, which gives you the most return. And every time they fix the violations, they will just re-execute this, hey, give me the next one which is similar, give me the next one which is similar. And all these techniques can work together in the same flow. So an interesting thing is the more developers actually fixing those violations, the more we will learn and we'll train our models automatically. It's kind of loop like this. Static analysis executed, information sent to our analytical engines, it do predictions, give the developers information, developer fix the problems, send it back to build system, and circle repeats, and we'll, we become smarter and smarter. So through this like a stack of technology I just talked to you, we solve one of the biggest challenge uh, for developers in terms of adoption of static analysis um, systems because they need to understand where they would start from and how they can increase their productivity and save time when they fix those violations. The second layer of pyramid, which unit testing, uh, which I said before, challenging on the fact that developers might not have enough time to actually write those unit tests. So we challenge ourselves, can artificial intelligence help somehow to detect how we can generate those tests automatically and help the developers to achieve higher code coverage? We, the idea came from the fact that we have cool technology, which we call flow analysis engine. It's come from our static analysis um, technology. What it can do, it actually can simulate ex execution of the sources instead of running them um, at runtime. 
and it can simulate all different paths, how the code can be executed. So let's assume you have this uh, method and you have one line which not covered, it's line number 18. What we'll do, we basically convert the sources into control flow graph. And now we'll throw this to the, our engine and tell, hey, can you tell me, find the path to reach that particular line of the code? And by the way, tell me which initial parameters need to be passed to this method to be sure that we'll reach this line. And the engine, what it will do, it will start the simulation of executions. It doesn't know anything about which parameters need to pass in, but it knows that, okay, there's variable which initialize zero, there's conditions which actually X should be above zero, fine. And then when it gets get to this condition, if statement, it needs to choose where to go. Let's assume it will make a wrong decision. It will say, let's assume condition false. Okay, if it falls, we jump to the end of the method right away. So this end of the path, not successful. So let's go back and let's say true. So we know that X has to be positive to be true. And then the next action inside if statement that variable Y needs to be increased by one. Okay, we, we put the notes here. And then next condition is Y equal 22. If it's true, we reach our exactly our line of the code. And then now reversing this, we, so we define some constraints. To reach this line of the code, we need to be sure that your X need to be above zero, your Y need to be 22, but Y initial need to be 22 minus one because that was the iterations which is detected where it was increased. So having this reverse logic applied here, we can define that initial parameters, any X positive X and Y equal 21 will guarantee that that line will be executed. And now with this information, we can generate unit tests. Of course, this is a very simplistic example. Um, our technology can handle very complex tasks of execution. So there's a lot of dependencies. Um, we have, we can handle uh, complex objects and initialize them. And this technology is completely independent from the language because after you convert in the flow graph, flow graph itself has its own representations. So, this was kind of original idea. Can we use the flow analysis technique to build some model and help the developers to achieve their goals? There could be different goals. They might focus only on, <clears throat> hey, let me create the unit test with reach this specific line of code. Or maybe I have already test. Let me figure out how to mutate the parameters inside those tests to reach more code, um, uncovered block of the code. Or maybe <clears throat> I, I'm dealing with legacy system and I just want to generate tons of tests against my legacy code to achieve certain level of coverage, which my management wants. Um, I mean, the most, re actually the most real example of this, if I'm a developer, I want to refactor some old code. Developers has very huge problem with that because they're afraid that they will break something, especially if that code doesn't have any coverage in terms of unit testing. <clears throat> so the desired way to do that First, don't touch anything. First, generate a bunch of tests with high code coverage to be sure that that legacy code is, has good representations of the behavior captured by unit tests. So now you, when you can start making your modifications and you, you will run the same test, you at least guarantee that you don't be, you're not breaking the behavior which used to be in the system. So that's kind of more realistic example to me, how you, you want to achieve this automation generations of unit tests to have have high coverage of your legacy code to be able to start refactoring that. It doesn't matter where you start, what your goal is. We generate the model, which represent all the entire source, source space. Then depending on whether you want to cover one single line of code or entire method, or maybe entire legacy subsystem, we create the recipes. Recipes is a representation of those paths, which I showed you before with the constraints, which defines uh, how the parameters need to be initialized to go through those different paths. Then each of the recipe has some um, weight assigned because dependent on the complexity of the path, depending on whether we need to mock the objects or not, uh, and what the coverage code it will achieve, it has different kind of value for us. We obviously try to go with the highest value. Then we will solve those constraints to figure out which exactly initial variables need to be sent to, the, to each of the methods, and then we can generate that test. 
Let me show, because I, I talk a lot about that, but let me show how it works in practice. So here's um, demo applications, real applications, very complex actually, uh, dealing with like, well, traditional shopping carts. So this method is about add cart item to your shopping cart. I don't have any method at all here. So first thing I want to do, let's, uh, I don't have any test for this one. Let's generate unit test using our technology and we call it unit test assistant. It's plugin for your ID environment. Let's generate the test for this entire method and see what it can do for me. Uh, still doing? I think, yeah, it took a little bit longer. And this is just one test and it uses um, uh, Makita library to mock up some complex objects because it wants to kind of make that test independent from everything else. It's actually um, mocks um, our item, which uh, service item inside, it mocks entire shopping cart, shopping cart repository and so on. And then it's initialized the variables and call that test itself with, expect, with the path and the quality of that, hey, add this item and quantity one. Okay, so let's, for example, run this. And, but when I run, I want to execute. And during execution, I will watch how this method actually, actually executed, how this test executed. And I will create assertions at the end because I will know uh, what parameters were returned back and how the objects were initialized at the end. So I know what I need to check against. And indeed it generated nine assertions. So if I go back to my test method right now, look, it actually executed that. And then it tells me, okay, so let me show that returns result not null. So it's real object, it has some internal states. And here the value, which one is mean that the cart itself has quantity has one item. That's what we added. Good, so let's go back to my original sources. You see the coverage information starts showing up with the green, tells me that some line of code was covered and looking at this one, I already see that it's pick up the longest path to give me the highest coverage from one single test. Let me show you, like, let's assume I want to cover this particular line of code. It's some kind of nested inside the if statements. So I'll go back to my unit system and say, hey, generate the test which will just cover that line. And again, it generated some mockups here to initialize them differently to be sure we'll pass that if condition. And if I run this test right now, actually, uh, I don't want to run all of them. I just want to run this particular one and um, let's see what happens, whether it will be able to actually read that particular line of the code. Okay, it passed. If I go back and um, look at my coverage, it did green, so it did reach this one. I can go line by line and do something like that, but look, I have a lot of other methods in this, in this class. So instead of doing one by one, let me go and generate the unit test automatically for entire class. And to do that, I'll just, again, I will use my unit test assistant. Here's my source. And I'll say, well, for this entire class, please generate tests. And it gives me several options how, how I want to do this. I will not, not go into details, but basically say, okay, let's do this. And it will spend some time because now it has to be creating all the different ways of doing that and calculate all the possible initialization uh, things. And it did generate them. So let's just um, run all those methods and see what would happen. Because at this point, I'm just curious about what coverage I'm going to get out of box if I'll just do that. Look, all the tests passed. I have all of them here. And if you look at the coverage from top down, green, 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 green. Okay, there's one assertion which actually didn't cover, but everything else is green with a lot of like, we have if statement here, if statement here, we have exceptions which generated so it well, in this case it didn't, but here is throw exceptions, which actually was tested as well. If you look at the coverage, just for this class itself, 96% coverage, and I didn't write any single line of the code. So that's how efficient this technology can be. 
And again, this is not a very simplistic example because it includes a lot of different uh, services dependencies, which we need to discover and address as we go. So to summarize, we build this unit test assistant technology, which part of our JTest offering. It's a plugin for your different ID environments. We support Eclipse and IntelliJ. We generate unit tests in format unit, J unit five, J unit four. Um, it's, support springs, it's used Makita PowerMox, and it's completely independent from our technology. What I mean under this, once you automatically generate those unit tests, you can run them anywhere you want. Uh, completely independent for us. You can run in your pipeline, you can maintain them individually, independently, or you can still use our technology to actually improve them over time. So we covered those two topics which I wanted to go through. Um, if I have five more minutes, I want to touch a little bit about API testing and unit testing because that's something that you might be um, interested in as well. For API tests, obviously, that's preferred way to test your services, to test your backend systems, even the tested systems which UI heavy, but before you invest in your UI, the recommended way to create a bunch of API tests because if API tests are broken, then UI can be broken as well, right? It's much easier to detect. Plus API tests much faster to execute. Plus they cover more area. Unit tests can just validate those. If, if you test your API through unit test, sorry, sorry for, through UI, you will be able to touch only those APIs which actually used by UI. But the, the range of API which can be exposed by system is much wider. So what we do, we build which call smart API test technology, which basically can look at the traffic and automatically generate API tests using one of our product. So tests, which will be able to run and execute all of your tests against this um, front end, again, this API test uh, infrastructure. And um, we discover all the connections between different APIs. Um, we perform parameterizations and we basically build the knowledge about your services and how they work together. We can in efficient way to produce tests which actually will be highly adaptable, flexible, fast and uh, highly performant. For unit test, um, for UI testing, we use actually Selenium and the challenge which we dealing with uh, usually with um, web UI testing, when we talk with the customers, our customers which who join our webinars, what is your challenge number one in, with those tests? And they always say maintenance is the highest problem. The second one creations, but the maintenance is the biggest one. And maintenance can be split on multiple sub items. It's basically UI changes very often because that's what developers do. They change modified UI and the tests start failing. Or wait conditions can be broken or locators changing all the time. In either way, it's happened that test becomes brittle and breaks really often. So we build this technology, which allows you to observe the user's behavior when he actually perform manual tests. We have plugin recorder for Chrome. We capture that all the user's actions and all the traffic which will be associated with that. The traffic I'll touch upon a little bit later. Based on the user's actions, we can automatically generate use Selenium test, and we actually use page object model, which preferred way, the right way to do that. Now we can run them through your, uh, whether you can run them inside the browser or you can uh, inside your ID, or you can run inside your CI pipeline. But we will, when we detect that some test becomes broken, what we can do, we can heal them at runtime at the same time, kind of fix them on the fly. And upon finishing, when everything is executed, we'll generate a report which shows what happens. And we'll send back to the customer, to the user, to the developer recommendations saying, hey, we detect this problem. We could fix it. And we actually did at runtime. That's why I don't see the test failure. But hey, you need to fix those tests. And here's how you do that. So we'll give them recommendations. And at the same time, remember I told about the traffic which you capture. We take the traffic and we basically can generate API test in parallel, which will be running through so test. So you kind of cover both layers of your pyramid at the same time using the same technology stack. 
Let me show you a quick example of those failures. So I'm going to IntelliJ, and here's my unit test, which I, uh, not unit test, there's my Selenium test, which I already auto-generated for my website. I will not go through this process. I just show that it's indeed page object model. And it shows all the different fields which represent, um, this actually a representation of payable page and all the elements inside the page are represented as objects. Um, if I run this test, what will happen, it will fail right now because I generated against proper web page, but then I change it to different one, which I know that locator was changed. So now what it does, it tried to run the same test, basically it tried to make a payment and it's stuck here because it tried to discover the city element. And I know that it locator was changed, so you cannot find it. That's typical situations which you'll see when developers make some modifications to the program, they give it back and try to run the test and they fall, well, it failed. Uh, when, it, when I was executing under our technology and we call this like Selenic product, that's the product we built on top of Selenium, right? It actually observed that execution and it detect the test failed, fine. So it generates me a report. It will tell me where exactly exactly it failed. It gave me a screenshot and it showed me, okay, it's here. So now I know where to fix the problem. At the same time, it does tell me what locator exactly failed and it gives me confidence level. If I, instead of this one, which in my test, I will use one of those locators, which will it detect it, it can actually, I will be able to fix my test. So this is recommendations which that gives to me as a developer, but I want to do even more interesting thing. Instead of telling me um, which of them need to be fixed, I will tell my technology, my Selenic, hey, when you run this execution, can you perform self-healing for me? I didn't change any single line of the code. I'm just running it right now for you to show that exactly the same program will run under supervision of our technology and it will stack for a second because now it's trying to find solutions and it basically unblock itself, find the solutions, apply it with one of the locator and pass through immediately because now it's the test pass. What I'm waiting for, it will generate me report. So report is interesting now. It tell me it still didn't pass, but it didn't fail either. It tells me it was healed. So now when I know that, okay, so there was something happening there, I can look at the report and it tells me that this locator was used and the confidence factor like 96% that it will be working in the future. It's based on historical data. It actually looks in the past executions and predict how good is this locator. And if I go back to my ID environment, and now you see there's recommendations, there's window, which basically say, hey, do you want to fix your problem in the test? It shows me exactly the same recommendations. Hey, here's a new locator which you need to use to fix it. Let's, for example, instead of using that one, I will use um, XPath because, oh, like CSS. I like CSS more, right? Update. It changed my code automatically for me. I didn't type anything. And now, well, let me run and be sure that now it actually should pass. Indeed, it didn't even think for a second there. It just passed through because it's actually, um, and the report will show me that the test was passing right away. So th that's the way how it actually can observe execution of your code when you run your test um, for Selenium and help you as a developer to, or QA, whomever's responsible for this, help to identify where the problem is and suggest how they can be fixed. So, we kind of look through all different layers of our technology, how we apply this AI and machine learning on top of them, helping our developers, not developers, like software organization, QA, whomever is responsible for testing the products to improve the quality, save the time, be more efficient, and basically deliver the quality at speed. Uh, you can look at more information for our products and technology, look at our website. We have wonderful blogs, which you can read about that. There's one of the blogs for me about artificial intelligence. We talked a little bit more about what we're doing. We have like analytics report, which basically talks a little bit about 
as our product and where we stand compared to others. And you can download some brochure, which gives very good uh, descriptions of uh, our tools and use cases. And this, I think I'm finished. And um, yeah, I, I managed to do it before, before one hour it's far, so we're good. Great. And Thank you, Igor. We have a couple of questions posted in the chat. I'll read them. Uh, the first one is, um, is Parisoft code base, uh, sorry, does Parisoft code base provide a solution to the problem and fix all such violations automatically once um, a user fixes it in one place? Um, no, unfortunately not. So what technology can do, it can, once it observed that developer fix that violations in the code base, it can find similar segment of the code and suggest the developer, hey, look at this similar code because you fix this one, you probably have enough knowledge already and it's fresh in your memory, so you will be more productive fixing others. The fix itself can be different. If we'll, if we'll be talking about line by line, exactly the same segment of the code, then yes, we can just automatically apply, but we're not looking completely duplicate the code. We're looking, and actually for that purpose, we're using a classification technique, we're using neural networks actually, because we want to discover the similarity of the code, but with still the same Syntax, syntactical, uh, the semantic of the code should be the same, right? So they should be some similar to each other, but it's not exactly the same code. That's why we cannot just automatically apply the same fix. Uh, most probably it will not work this way. Great, thank you. I actually started the questions in a little bit of a reverse order. I hope I haven't yeah. broken any um, logic um, uh, since they're posted by the same person. but. Uh, the first, uh, the next question is static code analysis has major problems with false violations, specifically when we apply it on the existing code built over past decades. Is there a way to apply or train the AI model uh, to learn to ignore the existing violations and build rule book on that basis? I think that would apply a lot to uh, legacy applications. So, yeah, that's exactly what this model for. Uh, so if you already mark your violations as suppressed, and let's assume you, you're using our technology and they already exist in our DTP system and they already mark as suppressed, then the engine, our learning engine will learn from that. It will understand which violations you most probably want to suppress and which of them you most probably want to fix. So it will automatically apply the same logic. It will not automatically suppress them because Obviously, it's risky. Uh, human, somebody needs to review that, but it will assign those uh, percentage of probability whether it's highly possible that violation need to be fixed or highly possible that it needs to be suppressed. And then you as the developer will go through that and based on these recommendations, you'll have a good clue or idea whether you can or not. We afraid automatically suppress anything because even though the engine has high probability to be right, it can still suppress something that actually real problem. And in security areas and safety critical uh, development areas, there's no way you want to do that. Uh, if you don't have this historical data, but you're still dealing with the same legacy system, you can train it the way how I showed you. Start from zero. It will show you 21st violations. Hopefully they will come from that legacy code. Identify those which you want to suppress and mark them as to be suppressed. Engine will learn, then classify, run it against them, pick up other violations, and again, mark them to be suppressed. The more you go through those cycles, the more engine will learn observing your behavior and it will be basically be more confident to identify those which you really want to suppress versus want to fix. Great, I think that actually answers the next questions, uh, but I'm going to read it so that uh, if it's not answered, maybe you can add to it. Is there a way to create organization rule book where organization can decide which violations to be ignored so, so that those will not be triggered? I think it was answered, mm -hmm. but if there's anything to add, please do so. Well, our technology is not enforcement technique in terms of like it will learn and will enforce which violation should not be triggered. It's more as, um, how to say that, Big brother, but in positive way, well, maybe it's a bad example. <laughs> it's something that actually watching what you do, learn from that, and again, suggests you how you would, would do that and create prioritizations, but it will not automatically enforce 
for the same reason I just explained before. It, it, by, by, in case of being false, you don't want that enforcement. Okay. Uh, the next question is, does Parasoft code base work along with build process so that violations would be highlighted at build level? So it depends which pipeline system you're working on. Of course, uh, my examples showed you IDE, but we do provide our tools and technology to be integrated with different CI systems, with your own, which you run on your premises, with Maven build systems, or you can integrate with uh, GitHub, with uh, Azure DevOps, with GitLab, so you can run it there. Now, whether it will be visualized or not, it depends. For example, GitHub has good visualization capabilities. So when you run it through our engine in your pipeline, GitHub will get it because we support serif format and then you'll see fully visualized there. Uh, we do the same thing with Jenkins. So if you run your pipeline through Jenkins on premises on your systems, our plugin will show you visualizations. You will be able to see it there. Uh, we are um, trying to work right now on visualizations, for example, in Azure DevOps. Great, thank you. The next question, is there any correlation with the type of system being developed? You mean in terms of, probably in terms of model, right? If you apply, build a model in one system and just you apply to another one. So we did experimentation in this area. Uh, it really depends. If you're talking, it, let's assume that totally two different independent systems, different developers, everything's different, then probably not. Uh, and you don't want to because system learn, remember at the beginning I talked about metadata. It includes who is the developer, what kind of their habit, it will learn from what they do. If that's the same developers built another system, I would say yes, there's high correlations so it can be applied. But if it's totally different development teams, most probably you don't want that because the system might be confused and it will not, like when they try to apply one knowledge to another one, it might be mistaken. But um, it's something we can try and, and see. I think we tested it and the level of confidence wasn't too good if it's totally different development team. We have one more question posted um, from Sachin. Uh, is the technology being used to identify the code coverage while manual functional slash automated testing is happening and identify the uncovered blocks of code? Uh, can you repeat again? Because I, I'm just trying to understand what, what the, the question is. Is the technology being used to identify the code coverage while manual or functional automated testing is happening and identify the uncovered blocks of mm -hmm. code? Okay, so it's done through um, automated test execution. That's what we can, again, you can integrate with your pipeline systems and during test executions, the engine will report about the code coverage statistics information to the DTP or to Jenkins, whatever system of uh, uh, report system you're using. And then it will highlight and show you what was covered, what was not covered. In, in fact, in our DTP, we have a lot of widgets which actually shows us coverage information. Um, for the manual executions, it's a little bit tricky. In, you can actually set up our coverage engine to monitor your manual test activities and send those reports to DTP, but it's just um, more involving. So in short answer, yes, it's possible to do, but it will take a little bit more setup. Uh, if there is no more questions, Okay, I would actually 